All right, good morning everyone. Um, so I just want to um, summarize where we've, where we've come from and how we were going to, is that we've dealt with the Schrodinger wave equation and we've had a look at various scenarios of the Schrodinger wave equation. Firstly, we've had a look at um, a particle that's free to move. And when you look at the wave functions that come, that fit into the Schrodinger wave equation, you find that there are problems with the wave function in terms of the uh, momentum and position. You cannot determine from the wave function those two at the same time. And that highlights really nicely Heisenberg, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for us. We've then had a look at Schrodinger wave equation in particle in a box. And that's the only time we've gone through a whole problem of trying to get a wave function together for a particle. But what's really useful for us is that uh, we get an expression for energy for a particle in a box. And as chemists, uh, the, this works out really nicely because we have molecules that contain electrons in one dimension, very much like a particle in a box. Now, just to warn you that there's a quite, quite an interesting question um, on are you connected about par particle in a box? Um, and if you're finding it particularly tough, please drop me an email to ask for a hint of how to get started. So you, you'll see the problem seems to be quite simple, but uh, when you try and solve it, you might uh, run into trouble. And if you need a hint to, to work it, uh, please feel free to drop me an email to work on that. And then, of course, we've used the Schrodinger wave equation uh, with a harmonic potential. And we found that the energy levels were equally spaced. Um, and then, of course, we applied that to molecules where it's not exactly a harmonic potential, but rather a Morse potential. And we approximated the two to each other. And then finally, we applied the uh, Schrodinger wave equation to rotation in three dimensions. And that uh, gave us um, an interesting situation where we can, uh, when you look at the energy levels, we can work back to a rotational constant and we can calculate bond lengths. Now in three dimensions, we had a look at the Schrodinger wave equation in the context of a hydrogen atom. And of course the resulting wave function are the orbitals that we are familiar with. Um, and you'll notice that these times I'm not going in detail solving the Schrodinger wave equation and finding the wave functions from that. That's beyond the scope of this course. So please, from this point, solving certainly even from rotational, uh, solving it in a rotational perspective is well beyond the scope of this course, but we're going to accept the answers that come from it. So uh, in terms of the hydrogen atom, getting these wave functions out is quite uh, problematic and it's quite difficult and it's the only case where you can get uh, exact wave functions out uh, is where you've got a single electron in a single potential. So the question is that's not very useful uh, in terms of chemistry because chemistry is dealing with more complicated things than simply uh, uh, one electron atom and to give you a taste of of how you might deal uh, with a um, multi-electron atom, uh, you'll recall from first year that if you got two sigma bonds, uh, I mean, if you've got two s orbitals and you want to create a sigma uh, bond, you, you simply have overlap of those orbitals. And of course, if you start off with two orbitals, two atomic orbitals, you've got to end up with two molecular orbitals. But I'd like to look really what it looks like in terms of wave function. So we had we had our cross section, um, uh, the radial part of the 1s wave function. We saw that it looked like something like this. So if you're trying to make H2, for instance, you'll have a hydrogen atom which has an s orbital. Its radial function looks like that, and it'll overlap with another hydrogen's s orbital. And so that overlap will hope, hopefully make our, our, one, our sigma 1s bond. And to get that overlap, we simply just add them together. And that's what it looks like together. But of course, 
you can't start off with two atomic orbitals and just end up with one molecular orbital. You've got to also find the other situation is when you subtract. And so when you've got your 1s and your other 1s, and you subtract them, you get something that looks like that. The problem is, how do we interpret this wave function in terms of a molecule? Well, the way we interpret a wave function is we square it, and then we get a probability density for finding where the electron is in that orbital. And so we can't work with these as they are. We've got to square them if we want to uh, determine what's going on uh, with uh, where the electrons are. And so here we, here's the addition, here's the subtraction, and here's when we square them, what it looks like when we square them. Now, for the bonding molecular orbital, you'll see that when you square it, you end up with some density between your atomic centers. But for the antibonding, when you square your antibonding, uh, sigma antibonding molecular orbital, you'll notice that between the atoms, there is no electron density at all. And so you can see that this electron density on the left and this electron density on the right, right next to each other, is, is not going to attract. And so you will end up having those atoms not being held together. However, in the bonding case, you can imagine your nucleus will, your one nucleus will be attracted to this electron density, and your other nucleus will be attracted to this electron density, and you will have a bond successfully working. So this is maybe a slightly different way of looking at your LCAO uh, diagrams in first year. The only change I've made is I've included the radial shape of the 1s orbital. That's the only change I've made. But the result is the same, is that when you add them, you end up with density in front, in between the two atoms. When you subtract them and you get your antibonding, you end up with a region with no electron density uh, between the nuclei. So that's um, how we deal with um, maybe electrons shared between two nuclei. But I, I need to give you an idea for the complexity of, uh, of the problem when you deal with a molecule. So please don't, uh, don't be, well, um, maybe it's, it's wise to be uh, uh, kind of terrified by this slide over here because this slide shows, all it illustrates to you is that we have an impossible problem when we're trying to deal with molecules. Because when you're trying to work with the Schrodinger equation with molecules, um, if you've got a molecule like water, not only do you have uh, three nuclei, but you've got uh, at least 10 electrons. All of those electrons will interact with every other electron. The nuclei will interact with themselves, and the nuclei will also interact with the electrons. There are thousands and thousands um, of interactions, possible different interactions, even in a moderately sized molecule. It is a horrible, impossible case, almost impossible case, uh, to, to solve a Schrodinger wave equation. And in fact, it is impossible, even on a small molecule, to solve a Schrodinger wave equation exactly. So let me go back to uh, the Schrodinger wave equation. And that there is the Schrodinger wave equation in one or three dimensions. We've got the Hamiltonian operator. And of course, it's an eigenvalue equation. So size or eigenfunctions to the Schrodinger wave equation. But of course, in the case of a molecule, you've got the kinetic energy of the nuclei. Those nuclei could be moving around. You've got the kinetic energy of the electrons. Those electrons are moving around. You've got the interaction of a nuclei with other nuclei. You've got the interaction, uh, the potential energy for the interaction of a nuclei with nuclei. You've got the potential energy for the interaction of nuclei with electrons. And then, of course, you've got the interaction of electrons with each other. So it is not really straightforward. And of course, you've got to sum up all of those interactions across all pairs of interaction. So when you write it out in full, you find that the full Hamiltonian is there, the kinetic energy of electrons for all of them, kinetic energy of nuclei for all of them, uh, the interaction of electrons and nuclei for all possible interactions, interactions of electrons with each other for all possible interactions, and so on. So the, the form of a Schrodinger wave equation is impossible 
to solve as it is. So you need a strategy. How can you solve it approximately? And each of these strategies have consequences and those consequences uh, come out in the chemistry, in the, uh, in the work that we do in modeling. So it's really uh, important that we understand what, what approximations take place and what those consequences are. So um, just to show you an approximate uh, way, I'm going to very, very briefly touch on the Hartree-Fock method, which you've used in the modeling prep. Um, and some of the approximations that come through in that. Uh, the first approximation that's done in several methods, including the Hartree-Fock method, is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And what this does is it assumes that nuclei are stationary and electrons are moving much faster than the nuclei. And so what we'll do, what one does in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation is you take out the kinetic energy of the nuclei and you also take out their interaction with each other. And that's simply a series of kilometer terms that can be added to the energy once you've solved the Schrodinger wave equation. So the first approximation done uh, tries to simplify it. And you can see that it succeeded a little bit in making it a little bit simpler, but the result is still horrendous. And the, what's left is still quite horrible in terms of what's left. Okay, so the first thing uh, does, the first thing that's done is we take out um, the kinetic energy, that comes to zero. This term, the interaction of the nuclei with the other, doesn't come to zero, but we can add it in at the end. So what we can do is we have it simpler, but we can also, when we've solved the Schrodinger wave equation, and we've got our energies, we simply add the nuclear repulsion term to um, the energy values that you get. Okay, so that's one way of making it a little bit easier. Now, you've still got um, a horrible Schrodinger wave equation to solve, but um, perhaps it's ever so slightly simpler by making this approximation. Okay, that's still not enough uh, in many cases to, to be able to solve the Schrodinger wave equation. So uh, there's some other approximations that, that uh, take place and one that I really like because I'm a chemist is that is the Hartree um, Hartree approximation and it says that you don't uh, work with a single wave function for all electrons at once and um, rather your all electron wave function is a product of individual wave functions it's a Hartree product so what it's saying is don't try and solve a wave equation for the whole molecule at once. Solve for orbitals. And so what happens in this approximation is that you end up with a series of uh, energy values that are associated with the orbitals. And working with orbitals is something that's really, um, it's intuitive for a chemist. So I really like this approximation where you don't try and find a wave function that belongs to everything, you separate it into parts and you have a product and each of those parts is an orbital. You will end up with your um, series of orbitals, including your highest occupied molecular orbital and your lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Which means that your Schrodinger wave equation is not no longer H psi E psi. You end up with something that looks like this, where you've got the Fock operator and your um, uh, your orbitals um, and your, your molecular orbitals and you end up with an energy of those orbitals. But just be careful because the way this is built up, this operator is totally different to any we've seen and any we we're going to discuss. There's a problem with it. The Fock operator includes a mean field of all the other electrons. So when you're looking at one particular electron, um, all the other electrons are included as a single term um, as a mean field. And so it treats the electrons as independent for each other, which means that they, there's no means within the maths for the electrons to avoid each other as much as they can in, in reality. And if you've got no means for electrons to avoid each other, 
and you force the electrons to come to come too close to each other, the energy ends up being higher, which means that using this approximation means that you'll always have a higher energy value than the correct solution to the Schrodinger wave equation for a molecule. And so there's a problem with Hartree-Fock, is that Hartree-Fock will always have, it will always have um, an energy higher, and your best case is higher by a value called the correlation energy. So in this case, you see when you're working with this, this uh, for a particular e electron, if you're looking at a particular electron, it has a mean field for the other electrons. And so that electron is not avoiding the other electrons as much as it could if you were to account for the other electrons specifically in terms of their movement. So the hartree fock always ends up with an energy value that is higher than required. Okay. Um, the third approximation is also quite nice in terms of chemistry, and it's the LCA approxi LCAO approximation. And of course, we've, we've seen um, in earlier years how you can take your um, S orbitals and you overlap to make sigma and sigma star uh, molecular orbitals, or you take your P, P orbitals and you add them together to make pi or sigma uh, 2P uh, bonding molecular orbitals. And the LCA approximation works really well, except that there's one little change that's made um, in terms of a Hartree-Fock method, is that you don't work with the S orbitals, P orbitals, and D orbitals, but you work with a set of functions. And so you work with a whole lot of functions that have those kind of shapes, but um, you don't work with exactly the same atomic orbitals that you have. But your molecular orbitals are the sum of these atomic functions. Okay, so just to give you an example of how the LCA approximation works, is you'll see over here. So here's a result of a Hartree-Fock approximate, uh, Hartree calculation on ethanol. And I have visualized over here the highest occupied molecular orbital for ethanol. But how is it built up? Well, that molecular orbital is the sum of atomic functions. What atomic functions? Well, um, you can see that there is an S-type function um, on that little hydrogen that's contributing uh, towards the highest occupied molecular orbital which will give you an idea that we, we're not seeing the full detail. You can see that's small. And so we're not seeing the full detail of the molecular orbital as you look through. Of course, there's a p-type function on that carbon, a p-type function on the oxygen that's adding to it. But notice, there's another p-type function on this carbon as well. So we're using not just a p-orbital, an addition of a p-orbital, but we're using the addition of several p-type functions to get detail within the molecular orbital. So there's a key difference. You're not really, it's not the linear combination of atomic orbitals, but the limit linear combination of atomic functions that we have. And so you can see all of these are what contribute to, to make that shape over there. So the molecular shape is a, the sum of atomic shapes, but these are atomic functions. These atomic functions are giving rise to the molecular orbital. Now, the question is, how many functions should you use? Here I can see on that carbon, uh, you can see that I've got uh, two functions, uh, maybe even a third. Uh, on the oxygen, there, there are two functions. So how many functions do I use? And that's all in terms of a basis set. So larger basis sets will have more functions, and smaller basis sets will have less functions. Larger basis sets will give a more accurate um, molecular orbital. So if you use lots of different shapes, uh, lots of different functions for your, uh, uh, for your atoms, then your molecular orbital will be highly accurate. If you use fewer, then your molecular orbital will not be so accurate. But of course, there's a downside to that. If you use lots of molecular uh, functions, atomic functions, uh, then your calculation is going to be slower. 
Okay. So um, just remember that when we had a look at the radio function of a 1s orbital, remember it looks something like this. See that um, dark orange line going down like that. Now, um, a Slater function matches this precisely, but computationally it's quite difficult to work with. If you have to integrate um, or if you have to find overlap, it's really, really tough to do that with Slater type, type functions. And so it's much faster uh, to, to try and use Gaussian type functions. You see a Gaussian function, here's a Gaussian function. These three are all Gaussian functions and they don't match. They don't look like a Slater type uh, they don't look like a 1s radial function at all. But note, it's, if you add these three Gaussian functions together, you get the light orange line, which superimposes the Slater function very nicely. So it's really interesting that if you take three Gaussian functions, add them together, you get a, a, a 1s a radial function from the left orbital. That works really nicely. But the amazing thing is, that these Gaussian functions are really nice to work with on computer. So integration, overlap, everything works really smoothly and nicely and you can get results quickly. So much so that if you use these three Gaussian functions, you get your results much quicker than if you try to uh, get an exact function for a, a Slater type orbital. So the three Gaussian functions approximate the Slater type orbital, but they make computation very efficient. And you'll notice that one of the choices you had on WebMo for calculations is called Gaussian. And of course, um, that's uh, the program where these were, were used, first used. So um, one basis set that you might have used is STO3G. And what is STO3G says, well, let's use three Gaussian functions per Slater type orbital. So instead of your atoms providing a 1s orbital, what your atoms provide is three Gaussian functions. And so when you do your LCAO, it's going to add three terms. Three Gaussian functions are going to be added in for that atom. And so STO3G um, is an example of that. Of course, STO3G is not a very intricate uh, basis set. It's an example of a minimal basis set. It's, you would use that if you wanted to use as few basis functions as you possibly could uh, for a very quick result. So um, uh, more complex basis sets, uh, for more accurate work, you will need, you'll need sets of functions that include different sizes of P and S functions. So for example, um, you might need to, you see, if you wanted to create a pi bond, for example, a pi bonding molecular orbital, the overlap of some large p functions would provide a very accurate pi orbital. But if you wanted a sigma bond based on p functions, on p orbitals, uh, the most accurate sigma bond comes from having a small p function. So the question is, what do we use? Do we use small p, orbit, uh, small p functions so that the sigma bonds are accurate? Or do we use large p functions so that the pi bonds are accurate in our molecule? And the answer is, well, no, let's use both. And then, of course, the lowest energy uh, wave function will, will, will have the proportion that's required. So the lowest energy when you've got a pi bond will use more of the large ones. And the lowest energy when you've got sigma bonds will use a greater proportion of the smaller uh, p, uh, p functions. So split valence basis sets use two sizes um, within uh, two sizes of functions so that you can get a more accurate molecular orbital at the end. So split valence basis sets provide more than one size of function. So double, z double zeta basis sets provide two sizes and triple zeta basis sets provide three sizes. So in a triple zeta basis set, you would have three P functions, three sizes of P functions per atom to build up a highly accurate um, uh, molecular orbital in your calculation. So you can always tell uh, what a double zeta basis set if you're using purple basis sets because they've got two numbers. You'll see the, uh, the three one, there are two numbers there, 
the two numbers there. So these are double zeta basis sets. They have two different sizes um, of function uh, for a highly accurate uh, generation of molecular orbitals. If you see three numbers at the end, uh, then it's a triple zeta basis set, and you've got three sizes of function uh, that are used to build up the highly accurate molecular orbital. Right. Um, Another problem that you have when using functions on atoms is about all orbitals are centered around an atom. And the molecules, having electron density centered around the atom might not be the right, uh, it might not be the lowest energy uh, case. So what, do you, what, what if you need electron density to be more on one side of the atom? So just have a look at this. Have a look, if you've got a P function on atom and you've got an S function on the atom, you'll see that the left-hand side of a wave function reinforces the left-hand side of that S. And so the left-hand side in the result will be much bigger than bef before. But of course, the opposite signs on the right-hand side means that the right-hand side will become, will become less. And so you can see that uh, by adding a P polarization function to an S uh, orbital, you can allow electron density to be centered away on one side of an atom. And this is typically what you would do for a hydrogen atom. You would add P functions to a hydrogen atom to allow for the um, electron density uh, to be not symmetrical around the atom, but to be one side of the atom. And similarly with heavy atoms, what you can do is you can add D functions. If you add a D function, you'll see the top on the left cancels, the top on the left, the top the bottom on the left cancels the bottom on the left. So the left side is, is, is uh, reduced, but the right hand side, the signs are the same. And so they reinforce. And you can see that adding a D polarization function to an atom that has um, only P functions means that you can, your result means that your electron density can be not centered on atoms. So you'll notice that on the previous slide where I said those two numbers, those two numbers means you've got different sizes, so more than one size of p-function available. This d on the end is interesting. This d is a polarization. It says that for your heavy atoms um, like carbon and oxygen, we're adding d-functions to them those D functions are being added so that uh, the orbitals don't have to be centered on the atom, but they can be unsymmetrically uh, oriented around the atom. Okay, so um, that's where that uh, the letter in, in brackets comes from, you may have noticed in the molecular modeling probe. Right. Sometimes, um, if you're dealing uh, with electron movement, so if you uh, are trying to uh, get a nuclear file to provide, um, if, if you're providing electrons, uh, then you might want those electrons to be far away from atoms. And of course, if you've got anions, if you've got negatively charged ions, you might also want uh, the electrons to be far from the atom. And so sometimes having really large functions, atomic functions, is really helpful in getting an even better energy, uh, a lower energy for your molecular orbitals. And so the pluses um, denote diffuse functions, and diffuse functions um, are large functions use, particularly useful uh, when you've got anions and transition states. Of course, if you use them on normal systems, which are not anions, and if you use them on normal systems that are not transition states, you'll still get a more accurate energy because you're using more functions uh, to build up your molecular orbital. So um, maybe it's a rather simplistic analogy, but if you've got um, a, a simple set of, of Lego, uh, like I've got, and um, so you've only got the bricks, I'm not sure if you know what Lego is, and you've got just this plain square, the rectangular bricks, uh, you could build up a model of a car, but of course it would be a very blocky model of a car. But of course, yeah, if, if, if you got a, a more advanced set that had different shapes like 
uh, triangles or half half blocks in, you might be able to build up a smoother model of a car. And the more different shapes you have, the more accurate your 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 final result is. So it's the same with basis sets. Uh, the more functions you use, the more atomic functions you use, the more accurate your molecular orbital is going to be when you do that. So it's the more shapes you bring in, the more accurate you can represent the shape of the molecular orbital. So basis sets, these functions are really important. Uh, the more functions, the more different functions you provide, the more accurate your final result is going to be. So um, purple ba type basis sets are what we've used quite a bit. Um, so there are other basis sets beyond just the purple type basis sets, but you can kind of get an idea of what, what the names mean. So um, the six will be the Gaussian types, type orbitals describing the core functions. Uh, the Gaussian type orbitals for the different sizes for the split valence. Your polarization atoms, so your depolarization. Uh, for heavy atoms, your p-polarization function for hydrogen, and your diffuse functions for heavy atoms and hydrogens um, are all incorporated in that basis set. So if you were to omit any one of these, you would um, automatically get a smaller basis set. So we've used 6-31GD, and you can see it's a much smaller basis set because it doesn't include a lot of the functions that are present in this basis set. Okay. So of course, the LCA approximation is that the molecular solution is made up of the sum of the basis functions. So here's your uh, molecular orbital, each of the individual molecular orbitals, and it's the sum of these atomic functions. Now, the question is, how, do we, how does the modeling work? Well, the modeling works what you've got to do is you've got to find constants. You've got to use proportions of the atomic functions that get you to the lowest energy value for your, for your molecular orbital. So how do we choose these constants to make up the one electron wave function? And the answer is that calculations follow the variation principle. And that is if an arbitrary wave function is used to calculate the energy, the value calculated is never less than the true energy. So you can tell how accurate your energy is because if the energy is going down, uh, the further you go down in energy, the closer you are to the real energy, correct energy of the system. Right, so as you use better and better basis sets, the energy becomes lower and more accurate. So you'll see that if you, you, you might have done Hartree-Fock uh, using the SDO3G and you'll find that the energy is quite high. And it gets lower as you use better basis sets. As your molecular orbitals become more accurate, your energy becomes more accurate, and the energy goes down, becomes more negative. What we'd done is we'd, we'd uh, of course, you can't use an infinite number of functions per atom. You can't use that. So how, how do you work that? You'll notice that these jumps are becoming less and less. And if you can do two runs, using an appropriate basis set, sometimes you can extrapolate to see where your energy will be if you had an infinite basis set. And that's part of a crack we did as well. But of course, with Hartree-Fock, because each of the electrons is treated as being in a mean field, it can't avoid electrons. The electrons come too close to each other. The Coulombic repulsion means that the energy is an added energy cost to electrons being close to each other means that in the Hartree-Fock method, we can never get down to the exact solution of the Schrodinger equation. We cannot get the energy of the Schrodinger equation. In Hartree-Fock, the energy will always be a little bit too high. So Hartree-Fock is just one method. Um, you'll see there's the moller -Plessit. There are post-Hartree-Fock methods that are available to us, such as MP2 and MP4. And these are really computationally intensive. And so if you're trying to work um, on any reasonable size molecule, you're going to let that computer calculate and calculate for a long time um, on these. But they are better. So what happens with Hartree-Fock is that as you improve the basis set, you can get down, you get more and more accurate down here. But you, the real solution, here's the full solution, uh, 
what we've got to do is not only use better basis sets, but we've got to use better uh, methods, like better post harsh tree flock methods to get to the um, accurate um, triangle weight equation. So, of course, if you had MP4, you could use a minimal basis set, but of course, you're still far from that. If you had MP4 and you use an infinite, a complete basis set, yes, you're getting closer and closer to the solution to the triangle weight equation. But of course, if you're using Hartree Clark, the best you can get is still way away from the Schrodinger wave equation. And the difference that it is away is correlation energy. It's the difference that it's away from that. Okay, so just be aware that we, we can do approximate quantum mechanics on molecules using Hartree Clark. These are also approximate methods, but they, they provide a much more accurate results, MP2 and MP4. Um, full CI is incredibly, it's unbelievably intensive and it's impossible to do this on any, um, as soon as the molecule becomes substantial, it's, it is, it's incredible, it, it scales, really, it's really problematic to do such an accurate calculation on some things. And of course, if you're using a high basis set on full CI, then you, you are uh, running into trouble. There are other methods. So there are popular modern methods include density functional theory, uh, which um, has many flavors. So B3LYP is really, really popular with organic chemists. And so you will might see B3LYP used with some basis set uh, to calculate geometries and energies and molecules. But of course, there are other flavors that are around coming from different research groups. So, um, uh, uh, this comes from Becky's research group. This is the Minnesota uh, functionals. These come from the Minnesota group, and they are more modern methods. So this is quite an old method, and they are more accurate methods. DFT methods normally have a very good trade-off between speed and accuracy. But of course, on really large systems, um, there are semi-empirical methods like we've used with MOPAC. They're very fast and can be used in large systems. Um, they're not as large as the molecular mechanics, um, and they are a lot faster. And of course, don't forget that also when you do calculations, we, we started off with molecular mechanics, and we still can use molecular mechanics. So where I am now, I hope, is that we've come full circle. We've started off with computational chemistry, and how we can use molecular mechanics to calculate the energy of bonds just by uh, approximating everything in springs. And then we've had a look at the Schrodinger wave equation. Well, we looked at the failures of, failures of classical mechanics and the case for quantum mechanics. We've had a look at the Schrodinger wave equation and the solution in several cases. And now we've finally looked at the showing the wave equation and solution in the context of molecules, which has built, brought us full circle back to molecular modeling. Okay, are there any queries? Okay, so uh, please have a look at this and relate this to the prac that you've done. Please have a look at this. And of course, I'm putting up some uh, some problems on are you connected so look out for the particle in the box problem on are you connected but there was a request and I know I haven't responded to the emails yet I'm going to I will respond to it there was a request for more problems relating to rotational and vibrational spectra and so I've got two really nice problems that I'm putting together that hopefully later today will go up and are you connected please um, the particle in the box is Quite an interesting problem and if you need a hint please drop me an email um, and I can give you a hint as to how to get started on that problem. Okay, any questions? Okay, then I'm going to sign off for today and I'll see you at 11 o'clock tomorrow.